So again, welcome everyone. Uh, we hope that you can make yourselves comfortable for this session this evening. My name is Irene Kelly and I am the Financial Education Program Manager here at WEAVE. Um, for those that don't know WEAVE, and this is your first time coming to one of our webinars, WEAVE is a nonprofit organization. We've been working in the Santa Barbara and Ventura County for over 29 years. We offer different programs in English and Spanish. Our, our main goal is to support and empower local entrepreneurs, providing business loans, business training, coaching, financial education, business recovery resources, among other things. So it is a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. Today, we're going to be covering a very, very important subject, especially considering the year that we've all been through. It's going to be very important to look at our numbers and understand how we can organize them and understand how we can prepare to close the books for this year. So for, to have that conversation, we have one of our favorite QuickBooks experts, David Mahachek. Today, we're going to be talking about how we can avoid common year-end accounting mistakes using QuickBooks. So a little bit about our guest. He is actually our Weave QuickBooks coach. So David helps business owners navigate through their financials, get organized and gain peace and clarity when it comes to your businesses. So he's an independent bookkeeper. He has been serving small businesses and nonprofit organizations in Santa Barbara for a while. And with the onset of the COVID crisis, he became part of our disaster recovery team. So he's been also assisting a lot of our WEAVE clients with preparing them for loan applications and also kind of navigating their finances and identify strategies to move forward. So your financials can be very powerful. So it's important for us to take the time to get everything organized and we're not alone in this process, right? We can use software, we can use platforms that are going to help the process become smoother. And most importantly, you're not alone in regards to those people that help you get that taken care of. So David is one of those people. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone to our speaker for today, David. I'm going to stop sharing so he can share his screen as well. Thank you, Irene. And I will share my screen now. Irene, I could not figure out how to post those notes in the chat room, so I emailed them to you. Okay, I'll be posting yeah, them. And I'm going to invite everyone here to write down your questions. If you think of a question, although we're going to have the Q&A at the end of the session, sometimes when we think of a question, we have to put it, write it down. So I'm going to be tracking all those questions. So please feel free to just write them in the chat or in the Q&A, whatever, whatever you prefer and then we'll cover them at the end of the session. Thank you, Irene. Mm -hmm. So welcome everyone who's here with us this evening. Thank you for taking a little bit of time uh, out of your evening to spend with us. I am gonna be covering some very common accounting and record keeping errors that I encounter a lot when I'm doing helping people with their books. I do want to start with just a general disclosure uh, that we're not teaching you how to do a full financial audit. I'm not a CPA and I'm also not a tax professional. If anything that we cover tonight does raise questions about the accuracy of your books or the accuracy of your tax records, please consult a qualified professional uh, to do that. What I am is an expert on QuickBooks and QuickBooks Online. And while I am helping my clients, there are certain very common record keeping errors that are easy to identify and usually pretty easy also to correct. And I would like to spend this evening covering those with you. On a fundamental level, bookkeeping is simply data entry. And the, well, QuickBooks has a number of very terrific reporting functions. Those reports, your profit and loss statement, your income by customer summary, 
your balance sheet reports, all of those reports are only as good as the data that goes into QuickBooks. Garbage in, garbage out. If the data are wrong, the reports that QuickBooks can generate for you are simply meaningless. So here are some common trouble spots that I would encourage you to take a look at as you're reviewing your books for the end of the year. All these three accounting reports, the Holy Trinity. These are three reports that every business owner should be very familiar with and should review in their books on a routine basis. The accounts receivable aging, the balance sheet, and the profit and loss. Let's start with the accounts receivable aging summary. Basically, all this is, is a record of who owes you money. Accounts that are current are accounts that are currently due, but they're not overdue. And then the accounts are recorded in order of how past due the bill is. A customer that's one to 30 days past due, it's probably no big deal. Maybe a friendly reminder, did you get the invoice, is sufficient. But accounts that are 30 or more days past due require your attention, particularly at the year end. There's a couple of reasons that you might find old past due accounts in QuickBooks. The first is maybe the client canceled the order and the order didn't get canceled in QuickBooks. So a quick investigation, open the invoice, you can open the invoice from the report, from the accounting, uh, from the accounts receivable aging report and just see, is this still a validly open invoice? Perhaps the client did pay but the payment that you received from the client was not applied to the open invoice. This is a very common problem, and it could happen that it was applied to the wrong, in, wrong invoice, or it could happen that the payment was recorded as a new sale. That happens very often, and the result of that is that the sale gets recorded twice on your profit and loss statement resulting in overstating your income. So if you do discover that the client, this is an open invoice that the client in fact paid, it is important to correct the, the mistake. A final possibility is one that none of us as business owners would like to think much about, but it's a legitimate invoice and the client simply is not going to pay. In this case, at the end of the year, it's important to go ahead and record an expense for uncollectible debt. You basically write off the open invoice as an uncollectible debt expense and your bookkeeper or your accountant can help you record that expense. Now let's look at the balance sheet. The balance sheet is where we'll spend most of our time this evening because there are several things that could occur and be noticeable on your balance sheet. A balance sheet is simply a statement of all of your assets, such as cash in your checking account, cash in your savings account, money that people owe you, your accounts receivable, inventory, and fixed assets like furniture or equipment. It also covers liabilities or what you owe. It would cover things like unpaid sales taxes, sales taxes that you have collected but have not yet remitted back to the state. Things like perhaps you have an auto loan, perhaps you have a small business association loan. These are all records of liabilities or money that you owe someone in QuickBooks. In short, the balance sheet is simply a record of what you own and what you owe. And there are several potential signs of trouble to look for here. The first thing I would have you look for are any negative balances on your balance sheet. 
As a general rule, we do not expect to see negative balances on a balance sheet. A negative balance in a checking account means that the account is overdrawn. It could happen, but chances are that's not the case. A negative balance can't be possible in certain kinds of asset accounts. You couldn't possibly have a negative balance, for instance, in a fixed asset account. Your, your truck, your vehicle cannot possible, cannot possibly have a negative balance on it. You also can't have a negative balance in undeposited funds. If you see negative balances in an asset account, it's something that requires your attention. Likewise, a negative balance in a liability account would indicate that you paid more than you owed. A negative balance on a credit card account, for instance, would indicate that you had paid more than you charged on the card. A negative balance in the Board of Equalization payable or a sales tax payable account would indicate that you remitted more in sales taxes than you collected. So negative balances in, a, in the liability account clearly mean that you need to pay some attention and figure out what's going on. The only place on the balance sheet where we might expect to see a negative balance would be in the equity portion of the balance sheet. And there are a couple of reasons that we might see a negative balance there. One is you may have taken out a loan to start the business buy equipment, in which case the business owes more than the business has in assets, and you would see a negative balance in the equity account. You may also see a negative balance if you pay yourself in the form of owner's draws or payments from the equity in your business. That might actually be a good thing because we're all in the business of business in order to make money. So if you see a negative balance in owner's draws and personal expenses, it might indicate that in fact, you're taking some money and you're paying yourself from your business. That's a good thing. So to summarize, there are a couple of um, issues in the balance sheet that we might take a look at and negative balances are one of them. The second area where I would draw your attention is surprisingly common, and that is the existence of unreconciled accounts on your balance sheet. As a rule, all accounts on your balance sheet should be reconciled on a routine basis. Most of them are reconciled monthly. Your bank account, for instance, should be reconciled to your bank statement on a monthly basis. Loan accounts, should be reconciled to your liability accounts on a monthly basis. So if there are unreconciled accounts in QuickBooks and you can check very quickly to see how recently an account was reconciled, those should be reconciled to the year end. Accounts are considered reconciled when the difference between what's in QuickBooks and what appears on your bank statement is zero. It sounds a little odd because we are in business to make money, but in accounting and bookkeeping, zero is the magic number. We want zero difference between what the bank says and what QuickBooks says. Accounts may not reconcile if there is a discrepancy between what the bank statement says and what QuickBooks says, and if there is a discrepancy, it's important to discover why. There are several reasons why you might find a difference between what's in QuickBooks and what's on your bank statement. All of them require your attention as a business. You might discover, for instance, that there are charges on your bank statement or your credit card statement that you don't recognize. Is it perhaps possible that those are fraudulent charges? If they are, they should be addressed immediately because you can get those charges credited back to your account. 
You also want to know certainly if anyone is using your account without your authorization. Another possibility as to why there might be statements on your or transactions on your bank statement or credit card statement that are not on that account in QuickBooks is that the transaction was entered to the wrong account. Maybe your business has more than one credit card and the charge was recorded to the wrong credit card account. Maybe a charge that you normally pay using your bank was charged to a credit card that month instead. So it's possible that transactions were simply entered to the wrong account, and that's a very easy error to fix. Another possibility is that there may be transactions in the bank feed that have not yet been added to your bank register. One of the best features of QuickBooks Online is the ability to link your bank and credit card accounts to QuickBooks Online. Those transactions are fed directly from your bank into QuickBooks, but they sit there in a holding tank. They have not yet been entered into your bank register in QuickBooks until you tell QuickBooks what to do with them. Each transaction requires three components, who you paid, what you paid them for, and how much you paid them. QuickBooks doesn't know that information until you tell it. It will know the amount of the transaction because that was brought in from the bank, but it doesn't know who you paid or what you paid them for until you categorize those transactions and add them to your bank feed. It's possible if you see transactions on your bank statement that do not appear in the reconciliation when you go to reconcile your accounts, that there are transactions sitting in your bank feed that are waiting there for your attention. Finally, it's also possible that you may discover transactions that don't appear in, in that appear in QuickBooks that do not appear on your bank statement. This can happen, for instance, let's say that I write a check and the person who received the check hasn't deposited it yet. There are many reasons that, um, that you might discover that there are transactions in QuickBooks that do not appear on your bank statement and they require your attention. The ones we really want to pay attention to are those that are old. So let's say that you're reconciling a December account and you have transactions in your reconciliation report uncleared, unreconciled, going back to September. Chances are there is a, uh, a, a record keeping error. In order to find these transactions, you'll go to the reconciliation menu in QuickBooks and down where, uh, here below where it says, add the following information, you'll see in blue lettering, uh, the opportunity to take a look at the last reconciliation statement. This is what it will look like. The reconciliation report shows the, a record of all transactions that were cleared during the last reconciliation period. But more importantly, it shows transactions that are sitting in QuickBooks. They have been recorded in QuickBooks on your register, but have not yet been reconciled. These appear in a section called uncleared checks and payments. And in this particular form of the report, you might notice that the last reconciliation date for this account was December 4th. But we have uncleared transactions going all the way back to September there's probably a mistake. 
And I've seen this, by the way, where I have uncleared transactions going back years that need to be adjusted. Uh, if you see old uncleared transactions in your reconciliation report, there's almost always an error. There are a couple of reasons that we might find these transactions on the reconciliation report. The simplest is, as I mentioned before, you wrote someone a check and it's still sitting on their desk. You paid a bill, they simply never deposited your check or the cat was playing on the desk, it got dumped in the trash can, um, you know, it's sitting behind somebody's desk, it got dropped and so on. There's any number of reasons that checks don't, don't clear and obviously the reasonable and logical thing to do is to contact the person you paid and find out why the check still hasn't cleared. Another possibility that happens really quite frequently is that there may be duplicate transactions. Duplicate transactions can happen when a bill payment is manually entered in QuickBooks, but when you go to classify transactions in your bank feed, you add it again as a new expense. In this particular case, the expense has been entered twice, resulting in overstating your expenses on the profit and loss statement. So clearly this is something that needs to be corrected. Duplicate transactions, by the way, happen very, very frequently in my experience. It's a very easy mistake to make. In the case of a duplicate payment, all you need to do is find the duplicate and uh, either delete the duplicate or um, void the one that was already reconciled. I also see customer payments on invoices and sales receipts being entered as new sales from the bank feed. So the case I just described was a situation where a bill was paid, manually entered in QuickBooks, but then entered a second time when reviewing transactions in the bank feed. The same thing can happen when recording customer payments. You invoice a customer, that invoice, if you're handling your books on an accrual basis, is recorded as income on your profit and loss statement. If, when you receive that payment and go to, trans, to categorize that deposit in the bank feed, you categorize that as a new sale, you have recorded the sale twice and therefore overstated your income that needs to be corrected because you don't wanna pay taxes on income that you didn't receive. In either case, when you have duplicate transactions in your, register, in your bank register, your profit and loss statement is not going to be accurate. And that means it is not ready to send to your tax person because your, your profit and loss will not be correct. You could be paying taxes on income you didn't receive, or you could be taking deductions for expenses that you didn't pay. Discrepancies in loan accounts are also a very, very common issue that I see. The typical scenario where I see the error in loan accounts is where the loan payment is being recorded as an expense. Loan payments should generally be divided into two parts. Part of the payment is a payment of principal, and that's a balance sheet transaction. Money goes from your checking account and reduces the checking balance and also reduces the balance of the liability or the loan. The second part of the transaction is the interest payment. This is an expense that shows up on your profit and loss statement and it's handled differently. Every loan payment should be broken into payment of principal versus 
payment of interest, one being a balance sheet transaction, the second being a profit and loss sheet transaction. If you don't record this correctly, the liability account will not be reduced and you'll be claiming an expense that you didn't pay. So you, you claimed an expense when you bought the truck, for instance. Um, if you then also record a payment on the auto loan as a new expense, you have recorded the expense twice and that needs to be corrected. The bottom line here and the point that I would really emphasize to you this evening is the purpose of reconciliation. It's not just an exercise and something to uh, put on your to-do list. The whole purpose of reconciling QuickBooks to your bank statements is to discover and correct errors. There is probably no more efficient or effective way to discover record keeping errors in QuickBooks than to reconcile your accounts on a routine basis. So on the balance sheet, I would strongly encourage you to make sure that all accounts on the balance sheet are reconciled. Another problem that I see on balance sheets are clearing accounts with non-zero balances. There are some accounts on the balance sheet that generally speaking should maintain a near zero balance. One example would be, for instance, a clearing account that you might set up if you're using Stripe to process credit cards. The Stripe account on your balance sheet is simply a pass through account. Money comes in and it goes right back out. You make a sale, the customer pays with a credit card, the next day, Stripe deposits the money into your bank account, minus any fees. Clearing accounts like this should generally have close to zero balances. If you see a clearing account with a large balance, it indicates that something's wrong. A large positive balance means nine times out of 10 that the income the deposits are not being recorded as transfers from the clearing account. What I typically see is another scenario where the, the client pays with a credit card, it increases the balance in the, the Stripe clearing account, but when you see the transaction in the bank feed, the deposit is recorded as a sales income. In this case, once again, you have recorded the income twice, overstating income, and you're gonna be paying taxes on money you didn't receive. I see that quite often. Clearing accounts are pass-through accounts, money in, money out. More rarely, I see the opposite scenario where I see clearing accounts with negative balances. This is a really unusual scenario where the deposits to the checking account are being entered correctly as transfers from the clearing account, but the sales are not being recorded. Obviously, in that case, you are understating income and you want to correct that as well. So the, the Cash flow when money is going through a clearing account is money in. A customer buys a product and pays me with a credit card. That goes into a credit card clearing account. And then at the end of the day, when the credit card batches out, the deposit is made to my checking account. Those two transactions must happen or the accounts are going to be incorrect. Finally, also on the balance sheet, there are certain accounts that as bookkeepers and accountants, we 
see as red flag accounts. If you number your books or you number the accounts in your chart of accounts, these are typically called 999 accounts. These are accounts that end in the numbers 999. But basically, these are uncategorized assets, uncategorized liabilities on the balance sheet and on the PL, uncategorized income, and uncategorized expenses. These red flag accounts indicate that a transaction was recorded, but it me, but it was in, it was recorded incorrectly. A transaction, for instance, that is recorded to uncategorized assets. Most of the time, when I see a balance in an uncategorized asset account on the balance sheet, uh, a business owner has transferred money from their personal checking account into their business checking account. The money had to come from somewhere. It did not come from a sale. QuickBooks recognized that it was a transfer from one account to another, but it didn't know where the transfer came from. And so by default, it categorized the transfer from uncategorized assets. The correction here is really quite simple. You record it as paid in equity and the source account is the owner's equity account. Paid in equity is the correct way to, to record that. There, I almost never see other scenarios where I see balances in uncategorized assets other than a, a business owner has made a deposit of personal money into the business account. I have never in my experience helping people with QuickBooks seen a situation where there was a, a, a balance in an uncategorized liability account. And I, I can't imagine the scenario where that would happen. I suppose that hypothetically it's possible, but I've never seen it, so let's skip over it and go instead into the PL. On the profit and loss statement, a an uncategorized income or uncategorized expense is usually the simplest error to identify and fix of everything that I have covered this evening. Nine times out of 10, what you'll actually see instead of the record being an uncategorized income or uncategorized expense, it'll show up in an account called Ask My Accountant. It means simply that the business owner or the bookkeeper didn't know how to categorize a transaction. Here's an example. In this particular case, the uncategorized asset or the uncategorized expense account is named miscellaneous expenses. And you can see very readily that these are three expenses that were simply miscategorized. A hardware expense was probably some form of job supplies. I'm guessing in this particular case that this sample company was probably some form of a construction or a landscaping company because they've bought something from hardware and, and from masonry. Um, so once again, probably job supplies. It may be attached to a particular job. And then there's an insurance payment probably business liability insurance. Each of these transactions have been recorded to a red flag account, other expenses, uncategorized expenses, asked by accountant or miscellaneous. And they're very, very easy to fix because all you have to do is open the transaction, categorize it correctly, save the transaction, and, and you're done. Finally, once you've gotten this far, you've done the hard work. You have identified and either corrected yourself or worked with your bookkeeper and accountant to correct transactions that have been uh, recorded in error in QuickBooks. 
And I recommend as a business owner that you take one final step by taking a look at your profit and loss statement. It's also called an income statement. And just open each expense category and do a quick scan. There's no point in spending a whole lot of time on this because as you may notice, your eye will automatically be drawn to transactions that appear different from other transactions in that account. You might remember the old Sesame Street song, which of these things doesn't belong here? Which of these things stands apart? As you scan through the transactions, your eye will automatically stop at those transactions that appear different from others. And all you have to do is open the transaction in this particular case. This is not an, this telephone bill is not gas or electricity. All you have to do is open the transaction, recategorize it as a telephone bill, save the transaction and you're finished. Lastly, a shameless plug, and then we'll get to your questions. We have a number of resources through Women's Economic Ventures to help you with your bookkeeping education and your education on, Quick, on QuickBooks specifically. Uh, we have a program for QuickBooks coaching. This is one-on-one -on -one coaching where we are working with you as a business owner on your business's books. We can help you clean up your books, get them organized, and take control of your numbers. I'll teach you how to use the basic reporting functions of QuickBooks and design workflows that work for your business. We also have coming up starting in, and Irene might remind me, it's January, I think, um, a six week course that will introduce the basics of bookkeeping using QuickBooks. If you're just getting started, just adopting QuickBooks online, this would be a great opportunity because we will walk you through step-by-step step the process of using the most essential functions of QuickBooks. Now we're ready for Q&A, Irene. Very good. So we do have one question here. David, could you talk about whether to categorize something as an expense or an equipment asset, like an HVAC system? Um, I feel like because we don't have many equipment expenses that it should be section 179B. Should I put it in Ask My Accountant? So what I would do is initially record that as a, as a fixed asset purchase. So the initial purchase would go on your balance sheet as a fixed asset. When you file your taxes, your tax person will make the decision as to determine whether or not it qualifies for a 179 deduction. And what that means for those that may not be familiar with the language is the IRS has special rules for certain kinds of expenses that allow you to write off the entire cost of an equipment purchase in the first year, as opposed to depreciating the cost over a period of several years, which is what you would do with most large equipment purchases. The idea behind depreciation is, let's say I buy an expensive new piece of um, machinery, the useful life of that machinery is five years before I would expect to have to replace it. So the IRS asks you to depreciate that cost over the useful life of the equipment or to take an expense each year for five years or that ultimately adds up to the total cost of the equipment. Under section 179, certain types of equipment at certain levels of expense are eligible to be written off as an expense, the full expense in the first year 
when you purchase the equipment. And the determination for that is usually made by your tax preparer. So the answer in sum, record it as a fixed asset purchase and then hand it over to your tax accountant to determine whether or not it should be written off and expensed fully in the first year. Perfect, thank you, David. We do have another question. Where should I look to fix an uncategorized asset with a negative value? So you have a negative asset or a, a negative value in an uncategorized asset account. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is from the balance sheet, open the transaction, select all dates for the date range, and then try to identify the transaction. Money came out of that account and went somewhere. So uh, chances are the source account in this case was simply misidentified. For instance, maybe Maybe you paid a bill with your checking account, but for whatever reason, it was recorded as coming out of this uncategorized assets account. And all you need to do is change the source account to the correct account. Um, but basically a negative balance in an asset account means that money came out of that account and went somewhere. And you can discover where it went by opening up the detail report for that um, for, for that account from your balance sheet. And I hope that answers the question. Yes. And if you also, we have the feature where if you prefer to ask the question verbally, we can also kind of bring you in and unmute you if you if that's something that you would prefer. While we wait for more questions, David, I wanted to ask, what is your recommended process when it comes to categorizing transactions? I know there's a lot of discipline in, in that process. So what would you recommend for people that don't have that practice yet, but want to, to get that practice going? My recommendation would depend on whether you are doing the bookkeeping yourself. So step one is make sure that you have a clear, well-organized chart of accounts. For most small businesses, the chart of accounts does not need to be an extensive list. The very basics are things like, I've got income, I've got sales income, maybe I have service income, and I have other miscellaneous income. So those would be three income accounts. You don't need anything more than those three income accounts. Under expenses, the typical expense categories are things like advertising, accounting, professional and legal fees. And when you're setting up your chart of accounts, QuickBooks actually recommends the basics. But when you first start using QuickBooks, it will start with a default set of accounts in your chart of accounts that you can then modify and add to, but the basics are already there. You've got personnel costs, advertising costs, automobile expenses, insurance costs, supplies and materials, office expenses, rent. The basics are already there. And for most small businesses, you really don't need a very complex chart of accounts in order to do your basic bookkeeping. So that would be step one, is make sure that you've got a good, clear, simple chart of accounts to use so that when you go to start classifying transactions and telling QuickBooks what it was you paid for, um, it's very easy to assign those. Perfect, that's very, very helpful. Then another very important thing that you brought up, David, and I would love to, to touch on it, is when people are investing personal money in the business, right? Yes. How important it is to, to process it correctly? Could you tell us a little bit about the options that people have, equity versus the loan to the business? What do you think? Can you repeat that, please? 
Yes. Yeah, so when people are investing personal money in the in the business, right? Especially now we saw it through COVID, a lot of people had to put personal money in their businesses. What are their options in terms of reporting that money? Okay. So it's an excellent question. This is this should be recorded as an owner's equity contribution. So the source account is an equity account and the target account is usually a checking account. So what you're doing is you're bringing money in from outside the business and um, it's recorded as owner's equity or an owner's contribution, depending on how the chart of accounts has been set up. But it's basically identifying that the owner has contributed money to the account from a source outside of QuickBooks. If the owner wants that money back eventually, do they have to put it in as a loan or it would be the same? Yes, so an owner could loan money to the business, in which case it would be treated just like any other loan. And it would be treated as a, as a loan to the business with the terms attached. Um, and this happens quite often that, that owners loan money to their business as a, on a short-term basis and then repay themselves. And the uh, loan payments are recorded just like any other loan. So in that case, it would be handled just like any other loan payment. So. Thank you. We do have another question. So is it expected that the balance should contain negative equity accounts if the business has loans and expenses has loans and limited income? Examples under retained earnings and net income. Yes. So. The retained earnings is an, is an account that QuickBooks creates automatically. And you would not normally, as a bookkeeper or uh, a business owner, you would not generally record any transactions to retained earnings. But absolutely, yes, you would have an, a negative equity account. A neg you would have negative equity in the business if the business owed more money than it was currently worth. So uh, in this case, most small businesses, the assets are simply cash assets, fixed, uh, fixed assets, checking accounts, savings accounts, fixed assets like furnishings, equipment, and so on. And you might very well owe more on the business if you borrowed money than you currently have as the value of the assets, in which case, yes, you would have a negative equity on, on the balance sheet. And uh, that would be expected. And of course, the goal for a business owner is positive equity. <laughs> we want the business to be worth more than we owe for it. Um, because when it comes time to sell your business, and I always encourage people, run your business as if it was for sale. Run your business as if you are trying to make it appealing for someone to write you a check for a million dollars to take over your business. Um, you really want positive equity. You want the, the business to be worth far more than it is than it owes. And so the goal is a, is a net worth workout on that one. Uh, you really want to achieve positive equity in the business. Uh, you can also, a lot of, Small businesses don't do this, but you can adjust your equity by including things like goodwill. I have a client, for instance, who purchased a business and the value that he paid was a combination of basically two factors. He bought some equipment from the old business owner and that was went into a fixed assets account. He also bought the client base. That goodwill or the existing client base has real financial value. And that's how we recorded it on his balance sheet was as a goodwill asset, the name recognition of the company, the brand recognition and the client base are all considered intangible assets, but they are very real when it comes to valuing your company and can be recorded on the balance sheet. Mm, I like that. 
So we do have another question. So how should we enter into QuickBooks bonuses paid to employees at the end of the year in cash when your payroll is done outside by a third party? And she clarifies the owner will be taking the money out from the company checking account and handing the cash bonuses to employees. I have to answer this one. <laughs> this, this question gets answered with a question. Do you want your employees to be taxed on the bonus? So if you're simply giving out a cash bonus to your employees, you could simply take money out of your checking account, uh, record it as cash bonuses, but instead of running it through payroll, just pay it out to them and, um, and, and, and call that done. However- She said yes, the company will be paying all their taxes. So the company is going to, going to withhold tax, income tax from the employee. Yeah, she says, yes, the company will be paying all their taxes. Mm -hmm. So I'm so assuming yes. The answer here is you could run this through payroll, call the company, call your payroll provider, and simply indicate we're going to be paying all of our employees a cash bonus, and we need to be sure that that gets recorded as part of their wage income on their W-2. If you want to do it off the books or under the table so that your employees uh, don't get withholding on that, technically your employees, and it's up to your employee, by the way, to report the income. Um, so your, your employees should report the additional income on their income taxes, whether they do or not, is not up to you. They should. Um, but if you are going to do that off the record or under the table, then you can uh, simply record it as a non-wage payment or a bonus payment on your books. And you can still record it as an expense because it is clearly a legitimate business expense. It's just a question of whether or not you run it through payroll. You are very welcome, Leslie. Then we do have another question. How do you record contractors' bonuses like landscaping or janitorial? So if I understand the correction correctly, you're talking about you want to, let's say, uh, uh, you, you want to give your landscaper an extra 100 bucks around the holiday season, as many people do. Simply yeah. record it as a tip. As a tip, a tip. Yeah, you're you're simply tip, you're you're tipping somebody uh, who normally provides services for you, and uh, you know quite commonly, you know people leave a check or a, a you know cash for their their landscaper for other people that provide regular services for them. You want to let them know that you value their services, um, and you're simply offering them a, a year end tip. Um, in that particular case, recorded as a tip. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So we can wait a minute if in case anybody has any other questions. But we did pretty good. Yes. Oh, we do have another question. What about EIDL? Oh, and we should have predicted oh. this one, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, so before we jump to the EIDL question, should I create a tip account based on our previous question? So that's a category that you can create on, on QuickBooks? You, you, you can, yes. Gifts, tips. Okay. Gifts, tips. So in, in my account, I actually have, a, I have an expense account for gifts. And that covers things that maybe I've got great clients. And so I buy them a little thank you gift to let them know that I really value their, their business. And uh, so, yeah, you can create a gifts account, a tips account and recorded on the, in terms of the tax line, it would be other miscellaneous expenses. Not one of, not the red flag version of that, not the uncategorized, but um, other business expenses 
is a, a line on your tax return and you could create, you know, an account for client gifts or for tips that you provide to valued um, service providers. Mm -hmm. And now we have the EIDL question. So what about EIDL and loans? How are they recorded as other income or as loan depending on forgiveness? Okay, this is a really good question and thank you for asking it. It's so important because most of us have this issue on our books. The EIDL loan, emergency- um, uh, Injury disaster injury loan. Injury disaster loan, thank you, is a loan. It must be repaid and it is recorded on your books as a liability. So you should create a, a loan account just like you would if you went down to Honda and took out an automobile loan, you'd create a loan, a, an account, a liability account in QuickBooks for the automobile loan. And then as you paid that loan back, you would record your payment divided, as we mentioned earlier, into the principal portion of the payment and the interest portion of the payment. So the, the idle loan is actually real easy. The exception is many businesses received the grant portion of the loan, which while it was called a loan advance, was not actually a repayable portion of the loan. So it, is, it was immediately forgiven. It was that portion of the loan that you received first, which was up to $10,000, $1,000 per employee. That portion of the idle loan, you do not have to repay and you can go ahead and record it as income. Unless you also took out a payroll protection program loan. In that case, the forgivable portion of the idle loan gets rolled into the repayment amount of the PPP. It's treated differently and gets added back into the portion of the payroll protection program loan that is technically repayable. So it, it's handled differently. And here again, I would work with your lender to really figure out the technicalities of that. The payroll protection program loan is 100% forgivable. If you meet certain qualifications, you have to use a certain portion of the loan for payroll expenses. That's a very generous definition. Payroll expenses can include regular salaries. It includes payroll taxes. It includes payroll processing fees, as well as any benefits that you might provide to your employees, such as health insurance. It's a very generous definition of what qualifies for forgiveness under the payroll protection program. You can also use a certain portion of that loan to pay overhead costs, such as rent, and normal operating expenses. That loan is repayable until it is forgiven. Most banks that processed those loans were, are just now accepting applications for PPP forgiveness. Uh, I know that the bank that I used is sending out invitations to apply for forgiveness in the order in which the loans were made. So right now, I could not go to that bank and say, I'm ready to apply for payroll protection program forgiveness because they're not gonna accept my application until they invite me to, to send it in. Um, that means that at least for 2020, I am going to have on my books a liability balance for the payroll protection program loan that I received. 
And in 2021, when the loan is forgiven, I will record that loan forgiveness as income. So it's, it's an interesting situation because the, the, to my mind, there might be an advantage to businesses that really did lose income in 2020 to realizing the loan forgiveness as income in 2020 when your income was down, as opposed to effectively being forced to realize the income in 2021, when we all hope we'll all return to business as usual and your income from the business will go up. So there might've been tax advantages to being able to realize that payroll protection program forgiveness as income in 2020, um, but you may or may not be able to do that depending on whether your financial institution that you received the, the loan from is processing the application now and whether they get the application processed and the forgiveness done before the end of the year. And we just have a comment. I, I, I'm wondering if you, had seen, if you have seen anything like this, David. So someone just filed for PPP forgiveness and they told her that the loan was forgiven. Then they came back a week later and told her that $1,000 needed to be repaid. And she also had $1,000 in EIDL advance. So she's a little confused by that. She doesn't understand why she owes 1,000 on PPP. Have you seen that before? Yes. Yes, this is the situation, the complicated situation I was referring to earlier. When you had both an, an EIDL loan with an advance and then took out a payroll protection program loan, the amount of the EIDL loan advance becomes subject to repayment. So the basically the Small Business Administration and the federal government said, we're not going to give you free money from the EIDL and free money from the payroll protection program. You get one or the other. So they voided or canceled the automatic forgiveness of that initial EIDL payment mm -hmm. if you also then took out a payroll protection program loan. You can't, you can't get the free money from both programs. So if, you're, if your payroll protection program loan is forgiven, then you're, you owe, you have to repay the EIDL loan advance. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah little bit complicated. And yes, so she said that that's helpful. And we have another question. So we paid out COVID-19 employee sick pay, but now we have a balance in our account under payroll taxes employees, which is what she believes from the credit government giving back the employers. Mm -hmm. Will this amount go away? We have not applied for any type of loans when it comes to COVID-19. Yeah, this is something I would definitely bring to the attention of your tax preparer. Because the, here again, it's a little bit complicated. The answer is basically yes. But <laughs> um, so the, the program, uh, essentially, as I understand it, if you had an employee that took sick leave, because they uh, co contracted COVID or had to stay home to take care of a child or a parent because of COVID, um, you can claim a refundable credit from the federal government for the employer portion of the payroll tax. 
So in essence, uh, in, in, instead of having to pay the sick pay, pay the employer portion of the payroll taxes, and then ask for a refund on your tax return for what you paid your employees for COVID sick pay, the government basically said, just go ahead and don't pay in the money on the, the payroll taxes when you, when you do your payroll taxes, just go ahead and keep that money. So as, as long as that's the case, and, and there, is, there is a process for reporting that, which your tax preparer will help you with, and, and they should also, when doing that, should provide you with the journal entry that's going to be required because it, it, the, the way to get this off your books and record that um, is, is going to require a journal entry and you can ask your tax preparer, usually they're an accountant, uh, either ask your accountant or, or your tax preparer for the journal entry that you're going to be required to enter to write that off of your books. Thank you, David. And we're getting a lot of feedback about your great explanations. Well, good. Some of this is pretty complicated. Yeah, that's why I'm like, David, on fire. Good. So we can wait another minute in case any other questions. Put to your head, we don't have any yet. Well, while we wait to see if anybody else does pop up with a question, I think the you know the the economic injury questions. Thank you for asking those because it hadn't mm -hmm. occurred to me to to put those into the the overall presentation, and and we're all dealing with that right now. Um, as you are looking at your books, these are what we've done tonight is really just answered some common trouble spots. How to identify errors. But I would reiterate how important it is as a business owner to become very familiar with your books. Look at those key financial reports on a routine basis because they really do help you to better understand your own business. Good financial record keeping and the kinds of reports that are available from QuickBooks allow you to make far better decisions as business owners about your business. Um, I can, it's part of the reason I find bookkeeping so interesting on, on one level, it's pretty much it's data entry, pretty boring stuff. But as a bookkeeper and as a QuickBooks expert, I find it really interesting because I can tell you a lot about a business by looking at the business's books. I can look and see where its revenue drivers are. I can look and see what lines of the business are actually profitable and which ones are not. Um, I can help my clients make better decisions when it comes to, should I add employees? Am I paying too much? Should I be renegotiating with my vendors? We can look at cash flow situations such as, you know, could I negotiate 30 day terms? or with some of my vendors and help my cash flow situation so that I could get inventory on my shelves now, but I wouldn't have to pay for that inventory for 30 days. Some vendors will offer um, discounts if you pay, the, the in, pay for the new inventory early. So you can negotiate those terms and all of that is stuff that you can make far more intelligent decisions about your business if you really do have a good understanding of your QuickBooks. I love that you brought that up, David, because I also see it from the, from the personal finance side of things. Um, my background is in financial advising. And just, it, it says, it, it's, it's well known that just managing your finances appropriately can have the value of a second source of income. Just the value of being organized and catching these things here and there and making better decisions, that can, it, it, it can be the equal of 
having more income there in the table. So we cannot tell you how important it is to navigate your finances, get comfortable with it. Sometimes we have this aversion of, oh, I, I'm not going to like what I'm going to see, right? But that's okay because what you can, what you're going to see, you can fix, right? It's, it's just a matter of, of surrounding yourself with, with the expertise that you need, continuing to learn and taking it one step at a time, right? I keep telling people, this is a marathon, not a sprint, right? And it's important. The fact that you are all here, kudos to everyone because you're taking from some of your precious, precious time to invest in, in your finances, in your business. And that's how it all starts, taking the time to learn and to ask. I'm so happy to see how many of you ask the questions. That's what we're here for. And David was, was telling you a little bit about the, the training program that we have coming up. And that is just such a wonderful opportunity to learn more about this, get comfortable with it. If eventually you hire a bookkeeper to help you with this, that's fantastic. But knowing, knowing about this can give you so much more confidence and that power to take control of your business. So I added the link to our chat, to our webpage, to our financial and QuickBooks coaching area of our webpage, where you can learn more about that training program that David mentioned. We're going to be starting in January, the second week of January. So it's coming up. If you're interested in learning more, please just log into our webpage. There's an interest form right there. If you, if you like the idea of having that class setting to learn about QuickBooks, or we also have our coaching program where you can have up to 15 hours and more working one-on-one -on -one with a coach like David. So in that link, and I'm just gonna put it again so you have it very, very easy to access. You're gonna see both of the programs. So you can just you know, browse both, see if one of the both um, fits you and fits what, you're, what you want in your learning style. I'm gonna encourage you to submit an interest form I'm the one that gets the form. So if you also want to email me, please feel free. Any questions that you have, that's what we're here for. So I'm, I'm just very, very thankful that you that you all um, came and, and asked the questions. Just remember, keep asking the questions because as David said, these are complex matters, right? Especially when it comes to new loans coming in, putting money in the business, it can get a little complex. So if you feel overwhelmed, number one, that's normal, right? Have some compassion over that, over the process and especially the learning process and reach out, right? Again, you're not alone in this process. We're here to help you. A lot about the coaching program, which I, I really love. I've been working with Weave in that program for about a year now and I've had a terrific time doing it, uh, getting to know uh, some of the business owners in town. In, in town. And we're having a really good time with it, but just in terms of a, a practical financial matter, you know, to hire a professional bookkeeper uh, 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 as an outsourced uh, bookkeeper, the cost is usually in Santa Barbara, you, anywhere so from 50 to $90 an hour. And what is the cost, Irene, of 15 hours with me in the QuickBooks coaching program? Mm -hmm in this, you're not gonna believe it. If you, especially that's 2020 pricing, okay? If, if somebody's watching this video after 2020, this is not the price anymore, but the cost for 15 hours is $195. Just yeah. $195 to work 15 hours with your own personal, with, like we QuickBooks coach, that's, that's the best investment ever, if you ask me. It's a um, fraction of the cost and, um, and uh, you get to work one on one with a professional bookkeeper on your own business. It's, it's really a terrific value because it's grant funded, right? Exactly. That's why we are able to to provide those prices. As we told you at the beginning, we are a nonprofit organization. So that's why we're able to get you those amazing prices. And next year, the price is going to go up to 250. So it's still a fantastic price. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a very, very important investment. I would say I would encourage you if you need that support and you want to dive deeper into your finances and especially what happens after, right? Once you navigate your finances, 
they can tell you those areas where you need to work or those areas where there's room for improvement, the areas where you're doing very well. So that feeds into your, your overall strategy as a business owner. So it's very, very valuable. And I see that we don't have any more questions. Is there anything else that you would like to, to share, David? No, uh, you stay healthy, wear your masks, wash your hands, uh, take good care of one another. And, and let's hope that uh, the 2021 very soon will turn things around and we'll have a, a much brighter future for all of our businesses in 2021. That's what we want for you all. Amen to that. <laughs> No, you are all very welcome. I'm just going through the chat. No, we're, thank you so much for being here. And here is our information. If you, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate on reaching out.